during the webinar today on various issues concerning territorial and sovereignty issues in the midst of erosion of international order in various parts of the world, we would like to once again clarify the international discussion on international order and would also like to discuss challenges going forward. As moderator today, we have Professor Yuichi Hosoya of Keio University, a distinguished and a distinguished research fellow of JFIR, and uh, he has conducted a number of years of research on the theme of liberal international order, and is also a member of advisory panel on communications concerning territorial integrity, and is striving tirelessly regarding how Jap Japanese public and private sectors should communicate regarding the issues of territory and sovereignty. And uh, we also have as speakers, Dr. Louis Simon, director, the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, VUB from Europe, Dr. Thomas Wilkins, Associate Professor, University of Sydney from Australia, and from Japan, Professor Chisako Maso of Kyushu University, and Associate Professor Yurika Ishii from National Defense Academy. I look forward to fruitful discussions today, and uh, I look forward to the presentations by all of the speakers. I have the honor of serving as the moderator I am the uh, research fellow uh, at JFIR and professor at Keio University. I am uh, Yuichi Hosoya. Thank you very much for participating in large number. There will be simultaneous interpretation. I would like to continue to moderate in Japanese. The title is Challenges to Territorial Integrity in the Liberal International Order, a Japanese response. The world uh, is seeing faltering of international order. As President Watanabe mentioned earlier, Russia's aggression on Ukraine and his forward, there is faltering of international order and regarding territory, uh, there are various crises in the world, in many parts of the world. We would like to address these challenges from the perspectives of Japan, Australia, and Europe worldwide. Uh, the uh, what can be done uh, about international order, which is now being undermined. First, I would like to invite Professor uh, Chisako Matsuo of Kyushu University to give a 10-minute speech. Uh, thank you very much, Hosoya Sensei, for your kind introduction. Um, uh, I am uh, connecting from uh, Canberra, Australia, e from a hotel. Um, it looks like uh, my connection isn't perfect, so I hope uh, uh, it wouldn't uh, cause any problem, But uh, and I would do my best, but uh, please allow me if it does. So um, uh, I uh, let me share my slides now. Um, Okay, so I will start. Um, uh, since I was asked to uh, discuss uh, territorial and maritime issues from uh, the Japanese perspective, I would like to talk, uh, start from uh, the issue surrounding uh, the Senkaku Islands. Um, even though, oh, comparing to 10 years ago, um, uh, the islands, uh, those islands are not making a lot of um, international news, but it doesn't mean that the pressure Japan receives from China is decreasing. Actually, it's on the opposite. Um, well, uh, since uh, the spring in 2020, um, it is noteworthy that the Chinese Coast Guard uh, vessels started to chase um, Japanese fishing vessels that enter into the territorial seas of Senkaku Islands for fishing operation. And uh, so uh, nowadays, uh, there is well, most uh, Japanese uh, vessels are too afraid to uh, do uh, their operations. Uh, so the number uh, that uh, the number of ves uh, Japanese vessels that uh, go for operation is uh, rapidly decreasing, and uh, at the same time, um, I uh, uh, was I realized that the Chinese diplomats started to mention in many occasions that Japan is challenging uh, China's peaceful administration over the islands. So they're kind of uh, flipping uh, the facts surrounding the islands uh, because uh, Japan um, has been occupying uh, the islands since uh, 19, uh, uh, 1895. 
And uh, China only started to claim uh, the Senkaku Islands uh, in uh, 1971 in December. So uh, it was very clear that uh, China is challenging um, the Jap uh, Japanese uh, you know, uh, effective governance that lasted uh, more than a decade, but uh, China kind of flipped the facts uh, surround, uh, around uh, the island issues. And uh, in last three years or so, uh, I also uh, realized that less Chinese fishing vessels are operating near the islands. Well, uh, actually China um, uh, started to have uh, new uh, fishing reforms uh, in 2017. So uh, I think uh, this is this change relates to uh, the fishing reforms. And uh, also recent uh, in uh, uh, probably in last two years or so, the uh, Chinese Coast Guard uh, vessels began using the AIS signals uh, near the Senkaku Islands uh, as if to demonstrate that they are there. And uh, uh, last month, warnings to the Japanese self-defense force aircraft that end uh, the level uh, of their actions uh, and uh, it became very uh, you know it became um uh, you know more uh, it, it became clear in 2020 in my eyes and uh, I was wondering why uh you know the changes uh, started then. And uh, I think, well, this is my guess, but um, I think uh, China's domestic administration system has already uh, been uh, initiated over the islands under the 14th five-year program beginning in uh, 2021. So before this, uh, China didn't have the administration system, uh, well, um, the official administration system over the islands. Uh, so, well, I, I had been uh, studying uh, China's uh, maritime, uh, well, the ocean related uh, national programs, but the ones um, before uh, the 14th five year program didn't include uh, the Senkaku Islands, even though uh, the Chinese uh, Coast Guard vessels has already had already started uh, the new actions. Uh, but, you know, uh, 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 but since uh, uh, 2021, uh, China included the area into uh, their administrative system. And uh, you know, the spring uh, 2000, in uh, 2020 is the year uh, that starts the preparation for the new program. So uh, this is my guess. And uh, in 2021, uh, actually on the Chinese side, um, China integrated uh, many uh, geographical programs on uh, national level programs and also local level programs into one uh, called uh, a territorial and spatial program. So the previous uh, maritime plans were also all, all you know, integrated, absorbed into this new one. And this new one is uh, coordinated by the Ministry of, Ministry of Natural Resources, which is a successor of uh, Chinese uh, 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 state oceanic administration that used to oversee uh, the, you know, uh, China's um, uh, maritime programs. And uh, under Xi Jinping's strong control and the military civil fusion, um, uh, all the program, all the national programs, plans are designed and managed uh, by the central leadership nowadays. And uh, as, and uh, this uh, new uh, program, a territorial and special program, uh, uh, it has been uh, initiated to monitor the entire uh, China's uh, jurisdictional water. Uh, uh, so it's a huge uh, plan uh, to oversee the entire uh, three uh, million square kilometers of water. Uh, and by constructing a grant monitoring network using satellite and IT technology, uh, which can be also which can uh, you know uh, monitor not only the so I think the Chinese new actions are footed on uh, the 
documents on this, and I don't think I have time to explain all of this, uh, but the water near Senkaku Islands are probably uh, categorized in the you know other use category um, in this uh, new program. Um, well, there are several categories, uh, but you know, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, Chinese fishing vessels are not really coming into the territorial waters of Senkaku Islands nowadays. That means uh, that area is not designated as uh, fishing uh, 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 for the fishing operation in the Chinese system. Uh, so uh, deleting that possibility, I think, um, uh, the, mil uh, the military use uh, or other use category uh, probably fit uh, the Senkaku Island area. And I think um, the South China Sea is one step beyond uh, the East China Sea uh, as it was integrated into uh, China's national planning system uh, 2011. Uh, and uh, I think uh, China has a similar plan and also for uh, many other uh, neighboring nations. Um, um, so it's been very difficult for us uh, to think about how to deal with this because uh, if you don't do anything, uh, China will uh, continue to slice the salami. And if you stimulate them, uh, China will make it an excuse and upgrade its behavior rapidly. We have experienced that in 2010 and uh, 12. And uh, recently, uh, I think uh, Taiwan uh, has been experiencing the same uh, in relation to the new uh, incident happened near Kinmen. Island. So, uh, uh, for the moment, well, I, well, I know uh, the Japanese government is trying their best not to make, uh, not to provide China an excuse. Uh, so that's why they're just uh, dispatching a lot of our uh, Coast Guard vessels uh, to protect the Japanese fishing vessels. But uh, it's been very difficult for them because um, China. Uh, has been upgrading its pressure on Japan. Okay, uh, and uh, talking about this uh, China's uh, uh, territorial and spatial program, uh, what is the important is that uh, China uses a new type of, uh, well, um, I call a spatial infrastructure uh, that connects um, uh, to, um, so China is uh, creating new type of serve a lot of many kinds of data, and uh, it is also uh, uh, constructing a new um, what they call a space based uh, broadband system. So uh, nowadays, uh, they're also co uh, constructing uh, uh, the communication system. And uh, well, of course, uh, in terms of the satellite technology, uh, China is a latecomer uh, comparing to the United States or many other Western countries. But uh, because China is a latecomer, um, China is uh, uh, China tries to um, uh, make it in a more effective way. So now uh, they are also thinking about creating a new type of industry out of uh, this uh, new uh, integrated networks. Um, and uh, in this uh, 14th uh, five-year five -year program, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, well, this is my, the picture I, I drew by myself, but uh, if you look at on the uh, right uh, down, um, you see underwater observation system. So, uh, you know, well, they used to, well, China has been creating this satellite system about uh, 20 years ago, but now uh, they're uh, a a extending this network to, uh, of course, on the land, and but also on the, uh, in, uh, also underwater. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is also a picture drawn by a Chinese uh, IT company. So now uh, the government is encouraging uh, many uh, private companies uh, to uh, you know create new type of services uh, by using this those uh, uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, uh, China has started to create this type of system 
um, of course, uh, for, to modernize uh, its economy. Uh, but uh, partial reason, a uh, partial import, important reason was that China was very worried about you know, how to create this uh, maritime strong uh, nation. Uh, and they, uh, they wanted to control uh, their jurisdictional water in a tight way. So that was a very important motivation at the beginning, but because this uses a satellite system, it actually um, you know, circulates the entire globe. Um, so uh, if you think about this in your mind, um, I think uh, what is happening in the South Pacific island countries is striking. Um, well, uh, China has been offering police cooperation to many developing countries. Uh, well, uh, and uh, South Pacific Island countries are one of the, uh, you know, probably the best uh, 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 targets for China. Um, so uh, uh, two years ago, uh, China and the Solomon Islands uh, signed a new security pact that includes uh, police uh, training and police cooperation between the two. And uh, so, uh, but you know, if you uh, if you think about Chinese Chinese type of police, uh, they use a lot of IT technology. Uh, they are one of the most frequent users of Chinese Beitou system. And uh, they also use a lot of uh, Chinese surveillance technology. So uh, by offering this type of police cooperation, uh, China can actually um, establish uh, those uh, satellite base and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know in bring uh, the Solomon Islands into the China's uh, technological found on uh, to uh, to uh, technology. China is now re uh, building a hundred and sixty one uh, ground stations, and uh, at the same time, China is now uh, this year. China has started to create the uh, uh, space based broadband system. So clearly, they will be connected all together. And China is doing the same. Uh, China has been uh, offering a similar police uh, cooperation to many developing countries all over the world. Uh, you can check uh, Chinese MOFA um, uh, homepage to see uh, how many Chinese ambassadors and uh, gen uh, consulate generals are meeting uh, many um, police uh, chiefs uh, in the world. Um, so well, well, clear. Well, even though this type of uh, you know uh, new infrastructure building started on the maritime system, on the mar from the maritime issues, but now it's been spread it, uh, spread it uh, to all over the world. And now uh, uh, this uh, type of technology um, is uh, is in a very good chemistry uh, with the authoritarian regime. So I think um. Uh, this will uh, develop into a new uh, international debate between the, the democracies and autocracies in the near future. I'm afraid, I'm very afraid of that. So uh, uh, I will stop here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Professor Masuo. Uh, there were some uh, connection problems, online connection problems, and there was also some uh, mix up with the interpretation uh, sound. Uh, we apologize for the technical issues. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, there was some inter uh, internet uh, connection issues, uh, but uh, we would like to catch up with that in the Q&A session. Next, I would like to call upon Dr. Luis Simon, Director, uh, CSDS of VUB. Professor Luis Simon, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good, good, good evening. Uh, good morning here in Brussels. Uh, and first of all, thanks to uh, President Watanabe uh, and the Japan Forum uh, of International Relations for the invitation, and of course to my good friend Hosoya Sensei for the for the intro. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm just going to offer a few thoughts on the link between um, the international order and territorial slash geopolitical disputes. And I'm going to do that by by zooming in on on the relationship between the so called regional and global levels of analysis in international relations. Uh, in, in the political science literature, there's a, there's a vibrant debate uh, about the extent to which regions 
uh, are subject to their own rules, actors and dynamics, and are therefore relatively autonomous uh, from uh, broader global geopolitical dynamics and about the extent to which global geopolitical dynamics supersede or even determine uh, regional outcomes. I would say personally that it's a little of both and whether the global level projects more or less prominently onto the regional one depends primarily in my view on two things. A, the nature and intensity of global power competition. And second, the importance of different regions uh, to global power, to dynamics of global power competition. So what, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is try, try to connect uh, global power competition, that sort of global level of analysis, to geopolitical and territorial disputes in three uh, in three regions, the Indo-Pacific, the Euro-Atlantic, and the Middle East. The, the risk, of course, of such a broad, broad brush approach is oversimplifying matters because the global level of analysis cannot explain what's going on in these three regions. Uh, but I also feel that we cannot understand what's going on in either of these three regions without taking into account uh, global dynamics and processes of global geopolitical competition. So uh, on, on the global sort of picture, China is, uh, and I think we, we've, we've already seen a, a good example of this uh, with the previous presentation, Ch China is arguably the only country that can really pose a sustained and multidimensional challenge to the existing international order and perhaps the US power more concretely. Uh, this is not me uh, speaking, this is US national security language. Uh, Russia, of course, is very important for Europe and is a, the primary threat to Europe and to NATO. And it's also challenging um, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, and allied interests globally, often in alignment with China. But when it comes to the global level of analysis, Russia is much more of a secondary player. Um, the Indo-Pacific is, of course, uh, the center of gravity of global power competition, politically, militarily, economically, technologically even. And as such, I would say that the fate of Europe is increasingly tied to uh, a broader process of global power competition whose center of gravity, as I was saying, lays outside of Europe. And Europeans are simply not used to that because they have been at the center of global, poly global power dynamics for too long. Um, and I think that sort of structural systemic change, if you will, compels Europeans to reflect more systematically about the various sort of, let's say, communicating vessels between the Indo-Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic. And let me just highlight briefly two of them, which I think are particularly important. One is the Sino-Russian alignment dynamic, let's call it. And the second one is uh, has to do with U US geostrategic priorities. So it, it goes without saying that the Sino-Russian alignment is a, is a highly complex animal. We all know their alignment is tight. We also know there is friction. And we're just trying to wrap our heads around uh, the question of how much friction and how much it matters. But it seems to me that for the time being, what unites China and Russia is far greater than than what divides them, in the sense that in the sense that the need to push back against U.S. power and the and their so-called rules-based international order compels Moscow and Beijing to contain their frictions and ensure that they do not go they do not go above a certain threshold. And I think this matters to Europe concretely because, as we've seen, by helping Russia sort of cushion uh, Western economic and political pressure. Uh, China is sort of aiding and abetting uh, Russia's assault on the European security architecture, uh, and concretely in Ukraine, right? Now, the second point of communication between the Europe, the Euro-Atlantic or Europe and the Indo-Pacific relates to U.S. geostrategic priorities. It just so happens that U.S. military power is at the center of both the Euro-Atlantic and the, Euro the Indo-Pacific's deterrence and security architectures, uh, and deterring China in the Indo-Pacific it is and again we 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 saw good uh, good uh, a good evidence of why in the previous presentation it is likely to put a permanent and increasing strain on US military planning and resources in the coming years and uh, arguably decades and this matters for Europe indirectly but immensely uh because the US is also at the center of Europe's deterrence architecture so um and and US military resources are limited so some some critics of the Biden administration have argued that U.S. resources devoted to Ukraine are not available to deter China in the Indo-Pacific. And other people have questioned that logic, pointing to the benefits of standing up for global norms whenever and wherever they're challenged, or also arguing that actually downgrading or eroding Russian military power today uh, would allow the U.S. to, uh, uh, to limit uh, uh, the challenge in Europe and, and then properly rebalance to, to Asia tomorrow. Having said that, 
I would say that Russia's apparent resilience in Ukraine and, and also the current situation in the Middle East uh, keep complicating this whole debate on trade-offs versus payoffs between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Now, two very quick points on the Middle East before wrapping up, because most of the discussions that we have uh, uh, on the situation in the Middle East, at, at least here in Europe, but also elsewhere, I would say, are often dominated by humanitarian and, and regional considerations. And these are very important, of course, but uh, uh, my sense is that we may not be paying enough attention to how what's going on in the Middle East relates to the global level of analysis and the global uh, uh, process of great power competition. Um, just by way of context, the Middle East, the, the broader Middle East region has sucked up a, an enormous deal of US national security resources and attention for the past two decades. Uh, and a US focus on counterinsurgency and state building uh, over the past 20 years or so has also created opportunity costs in terms of defense modernization and has allowed China and Russia to close the military technological gap with the United States in Europe and East Asia because the US was just looking and focusing elsewhere in other capabilities, in other tasks. Now, aware of this problem, I would say that the United States has tried to reduce its engagement in the Middle East uh, uh, in recent years and rebalance its attention towards deterring great power revisionism in the Indo-Pacific and then to, to a lesser extent in the Euro-Atlantic. Of course, the risk for the Middle East was always that less America could equal more instability and instability in the Middle East could always get out of hand and pull the United States back in, uh, therefore complicating that rebalancing operation, rebalancing towards the primary theaters of Europe and East Asia. I think this already happened with Obama's 2011 pivot to Asia, which was modeled by the rise of ISIS and the broader regional consequences of the Arab Spring. And, and of course, the opportunity cost here uh, 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 is about having a United States focused on, on legacy issues and counterinsurgency and counterterrorism and not one uh, re-optimized for deterrence in a great power context. Now, fully aware of this predicament, the last U.S. administrations have tried to engineer an orderly retrenchment from the Middle East. Not, not abandonment, but retrenchment, downsizing from the Middle East. And I think this is where the Abraham Accords come in and the successive efforts on the part of the Trump and Biden administrations to encourage an understanding between Israel and some, and some key Arab countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and Morocco, but also the Gulf countries. Uh, and, and I realize that that process is about many things, but it's also about creating the geopolitical conditions to contain potential instability in the Middle East and therefore protect, if you will, the geostrategic rebalance towards the Terrans uh, uh, in the primary theaters of Europe and East Asia from a US perspective. So uh, what we're seeing now, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, uh, is a concerted effort to push back against this vision uh, uh, for US retrenchment in the Middle East. I think this pushback coalition, if you will, contains different layers. Uh, you would have Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis in a sort of inner or first layer, then Iran in a second intermediate layer, and then China and Russia in an outer layer. Uh, and these layers may not be connected uh, with each other, let alone coordinated. Uh, and I, I realize that China may also be partly interested in stability, at least in the Gulf. But I would say that there is an alignment of interests between these three layers in terms of having America's broader regional design for the Middle East flop. And I think we've seen this pushback process unfold in various waves. One notable instance uh, was the China-engineered rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, uh, last year, and another more recent one where the Hamas-led attacks on Israel or the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, which sort of threatened to pull U.S. attention back into the region, complicate the Arab-Israeli rapprochement, uh, uh, and and therefore also eventually complicate the U.S. rebalancing uh, towards the Terrans in a great power context in the primary regions of Europe and, and the Indo-Pacific. I'll, I'll end there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Louis Simon. You talked about the ground global picture and the actions being taken in various regions in a very easy to understand manner. Thank you very much. I now would like to call upon Dr. Yurika Ishii, Associate Professor of the National Defense Academy from the perspective of international law. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I would like to share my slides with you. 
Thank you very much. As introduced from the international law perspective, I would like to refer to a few points. First of all, when we talk about the challenges against liberal international order, there are several roles that international law, law can play, especially be it Ukraine war or China's behavior in South China Sea. There is exercising a force in various regions. So against exercising a force, uh, the focus uh, it tends to be placed on exercising a force. But I would like to take a step back. And in a certain domain or area, what is the basis of allowing states to take action? That will be my focus. The key would be a title, territorial and maritime titles. As is known, in the South and East China Seas, both titles, territorial title and maritime title, for either titles, uh, conflict has erupted. And that has become one cause. Uh, and as mentioned by Professor Masuo, China in the maritime area is conducting activities that leads to the in destabilization. This is a classic theory, but I would like to apply that to the contemporary scene. First of all, on territorial title, there could be people who are not experts in international law, so I will mention this. Regarding a region, in order to exercise sovereign rights, territorial title must be secured. And territorial title is the establishment of a territorial sovereignty by a state for land area. And it is a fact that becomes the basis of such a title. There could be several forms. If one form or condition is fulfilled, such territory title could be granted like terra nullis occupation, uh, session or accretion. Uh, there could be the acquisition of territorial title through these forms. But in that case, there, uh, in many cases, such form may not solve these conflicts. So if there is indication of peaceful and effective sovereignty, uh, in some cases, title is granted. And there are various uh, precedents that has led to accumulation of criteria. This is a very complicated area, but uh, to a certain extent, criteria has been accumulated in this area. Acquisition of territory by force, uh, which is called conqueror. And uh, permanent execution of the control of territory. Uh, after exercising a force was banned by the UN Charter, such form of title has never been admitted. Last year, ICJ legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, there was hearing conducted, and the Japanese government took the position that such a title cannot be recognized as effective title. So these are the rules under the international law. However, how do we apply those rules? There are certain difficulties when we try to apply these rules. In legal debate, when there is a conflict, all you need to do is to take that into court. But it's obvious if you study international law, it's common sense that things aren't that simple. And in the international community, there is no court that has obligatory jurisdiction. You have to set a such jurisdiction based upon a treaty, ICJ. does have a system to be trusted jurisdiction, but it's only Cambodia and Japan amongst East Asian countries and UNCLOS. It's, 
is with regards to the application and the interpretation of the law of the seas and obligatory rights of conflict is indicated. So if there is a conflict, some kind of a court will be trusted that conflict under UNCLOS. And in that case, consent is unnecessary and therefore as you know the arbitrary ruling for by the tribunal for the south china sea was handed down but there are exemptions that is with regards to conflict based upon the interpretation of articles 1574 and 83 for example and China, South Korea, and Thailand have declared exception. So in the case of conflicts where China is involved, uh, they have declared exception that these articles will not be imposed upon China. And that is the limit of resolution through court. Another issue of territorial problems is the aspect to or limit of resolving these issues just through legal procedure. If court procedure can be applied, fine, but in many cases it is no longer applicable. So people tend to depend on diplomacy. But if we try to apply international law in diplomacy, various issues give rise. And I will give here two examples. One expression when communicated to the other party may cause misinterpretation or may invite unintended circumstances or outcome. Another point is with regards to the internal general public's emotions of the counterparty regarding territorial issues, and that could impact diplomacy. And especially when historical problems are factored in, this could be an influence. So there are certain limits of trying to resolve territorial issues by application of international law. And in East and East, Southeast Asia, there have been examples, there have been very few examples so far of maritime title. There was the Panama incident historically, but that was before independence of various countries in the region. And post UN Charter, if we look at in, uh, Presidents Malaysia, Indonesia, and Malaysia versus Singapore at ICJ. There have been resolution of territorial rights, but those are the only examples or precedents. And regarding maritime title, ITLOS has handed down a maritime limitation ruling and Philippine versus China case. These are the only two. Because the title bar is extremely high, it's difficult to resolve through court uh, such conflicts in East and Southeast Asia. And a different subject. Uh, I would like to now move on to maritime title. Regarding Law of Sea, in 1982, the UNCLOS was adopted, and UNCLOS, under UNCLOS, the, the seas are divided between territorial water, contiguous water, or EEC, and high seas, and in each sea zone. What can coastal countries do? What about other countries other than the coastal countries that are using those waters? What uh, can they do? One possible problem is whether this is a comprehensive treaty. In other words, what about the seas that is not uh, specified in the convention? Should we recognize those maritime zones? That's become a problem. Many articles in UNCLOS uh, 
or international law. That's been a ruling handed down by the ICJ. So it does have basis, but reserve or exemption is not possible. And therefore, if you become member to the convention, you have to accept all. So it's founded on the notion that the convention has to be dealt as one convention. So uh, there are people who say that there is comprehensiveness because of that requirement. Uh, prior to UNCLOS, uh, at the time pre-adoption, uh, there used to be Convention over Territorial Seas, Contiguous Waters, EEC, and High Waters, and uh, UNCLOS came about to integrate these different maritime zones and come up with new maritime zones. But there is no explicit article indicating that this is comprehensive. So there could we can uh, some say that we should be recognizing maritime zones that are not included in UNCLOS. Regarding maritime title of South China Sea, they said that UNCLOS will said will be deciding. However, in other precedents, is this supported? I think we need to study the matter more carefully. This is the assertion by China. One issue is the nine dash line 2016 after the arbitral award. This is more frequently quoted. In other words, mid ocean archipelago concept. Archipelago concept the Philippines, the Indonesia are archipelago. The Lagos and historically and socially, uh, they have been accepted as one state. And so there could be a delimitation. But unlike these archipelago, there's mainland China and there are islands nearby. And in this case, this concept cannot be applied, which is obvious. China is asserting that, as indicated here, Spratly, in Spratly Islands, delimitation and demarcation can be drawn, and title should be granted in the zone within the baseline. But UNCLOS does not admit this baseline. So should we be recognizing such baseline? China says that uh, other than UNCLOS, there are other international law to serve as the basis, but that goes against the comprehensiveness of UNCLOS. And I have a website called In the Interpretation of uh, Senkaku Islands, and I've contributed an article, and I asserted that this comprehensiveness should be acknowledged and therefore this uh, concept of mid-ocean archipelago and baseline concept should not be recognized. Most recently in Tonkin Gulf, uh, linear baseline was drawn. Regarding Tonkin Bay, I'm not able to show a map, but it's between Vietnam and China, and there is the demarcation treaty. So the linear baseline was established, straight baseline was established by China, but that does not influence other countries. But the inner waters demarcation is different. But these are some of the actions taken.
there are some base islands and the line is along those lines. But according to UNCLOS, in order to have a straight base line along the coastline, if a series of islands exists in proximity, then such straight baseline can be drawn. So it's been said, but does that fulfill the conditions under UNCLOS uh, Section 7, Article 7? Uh, there are questions as to whether it would fulfill those conditions under Article 7, and that needs to be further studied. At any rate, the integrity of UNCLOS is at question. That's it from me. Lastly, again, territorial issues are not really focused on daily basis by the general public. However, on the other hand, there's the Russian war, or if there could, is a Taiwan contingency, or in South China Sea, there are conflicts or surrounding Sentaku Islands, the Chinese Coast Guard vessels come. So territorial title is at the center of this issue. And we as citizens of each relevant party must seriously consider this linkage. Ter regarding territorial sovereignty, we are attempting to provide evidence to the government's position, but we truly hope that this becomes a subject that is given more attention by the general public. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ishii. There is a museum on, on territorial sovereignty in Toranomon in Tokyo. Experts provided advice in creating this uh, museum corner in easy to understand fashion, information is pro, uh, displayed, including photographs, etc., uh, to facilitate understanding of the territorial issues. Last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Wilkins, Associate Professor, Sydney University. And before we hear from Dr. Wilkins, I would like to remind the audience that we will have Q&A session um, afterwards, uh, and uh, please uh, send your questions in the Q&A box. I would like to take up questions uh, you've sent in the later discussion. Uh, now, Dr. Wilkins, please. Uh, thanks so much. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to um, thank uh, JFIR for the opportunity to participate in the webinar, as well as uh, also Sensei's chair and uh, all of the other panelists. So uh, as the last speaker on the roster, uh, I anticipated that much of the granular detail on maritime and international law issues would already have been covered by experts on in that specific field. Um, and uh, therefore, I thought I might zoom out and uh, look at the, uh, the bigger picture. But uh, Lewis has kind of beaten me to it. However, all is not lost because where Lewis sketched out the strategic dynamics, I'll focus my remarks more on what we mean by the, the notion of international order and um, oh, what's this? Um, being asked what language I'm speaking in. <laughs> I'm not speaking in Japanese, but <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, technical thing. So uh, all is not lost because where uh, Lewis uh, sketched out the, uh, the strategic dynamics, I'll focus my remarks uh, a little bit more on the notion of what international order actually means and um, also um, kind of highlight the values-based dimensions which uh, haven't yet been raised in the conversation. So we kind of talked about um, what we, you know, international order as if its meaning is um, self-evident. And obviously this is kind of, kind of the enclosing concept of, uh, of this webinar series. And um, so, uh, you know, I'd just like to stress that um, international order can be looked at in a number of ways before giving some examples of how I think um, the system is transforming. So on the one hand, um, in the first way, um, international order could be a kind of objective descriptor for the prevailing structural conditions of the international system. So what I mean by that is it could be a unipolar, a bipolar, or a multipolar form of order. 
Um, as uh, Luis also pointed out, um, it also operates at both the global levels and the regional levels, and there can be differences in the structure of that order. So, you know, a regional order could be multipolar, but the, you know, international order could be bipolar. Um, also, we might want, want to think a little bit, and this hasn't, I don't think, yet been raised, um, that we might distinguish between um, economic and security orders, and particularly in the Indo-Pacific. I think we can see some some disconnects between the the economic rules of the road and the kind of the security dynamics that are going on. But I, I guess um, you know what I like to distinguish in my own remarks is um, a second meaning of international order, which again sort of speaks to the overall title of this webinar series. Um, international order can also be used to kind of subjectively describe the type of order that states or groups of states wish to achieve and you know um which they they aspire to impose either regionally or globally so this is where the preference for western states for the the liberal or the rules based international order come from so this isn't an objective descriptor, but rather in this sense, it's a kind of values-based policy objective, a liberal international order or a rules-based order. So if we wind back to the first meaning. Um, I think that it's it's clear that um, we've seen you know we've seen some some really big structural shifts in the distribution of power within the global system, um, and you know that's also reflected um, in the Indo-Pacific region. So the rise of major powers like China, India, and you know at one time or another Brazil, um, alongside um, middle powers that are taking on more agency, so traditional ones like Australia, possibly Canada now, um, and emergent middle powers such as Turkey or Indonesia are reshaping polarity. Another thing we need to bear in mind is the increasing appetite for the so-called global south, whether these be major, middle or minor states, um, to shape the international order and get their voices heard, especially in the sort of uh, the institutional architecture, both globally and regionally. So where Western dominance, and by Western, I also include, you know, East Asian democracies, Japan and, and Australasia and so forth as well, if not exclusively Euro-Atlantic, um, where, you know, previously we had dominance of the global system based upon our economic and military supremacy. Um, this has really come to a, coming to a, an end now. And uh, the, the old order, what we enshrined in the liberal international order, is kind of being undermined by revisionist or reformist powers. So this takes us to the uh, to, to the second meaning, which kind of concerns, you know, what will a new or reformed order look like? We can't go back to the 1990s and US unipolarity. Those days have gone. So what's the new order going to look like? Well, you know, obviously the, the Western powers, the Euro-Atlantic and East Asian democracies in Australasia, we have a clear preference for the maintenance of this liberal international order. And this is where the values come in, because although the liberal international order clearly served our strategic interests, it was also um, based upon universal values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, open markets and international law. And this was very successful, um, you know, for for several decades in um, in bringing about peace and prosperity, um, both to the powers that espoused it and around the world. We thought this was a global export, um, you know, until recent years. So, you know, we sort of thought this is self-evident that this is a global good, um, even if it was our, partly our interests as well as our values that it was based upon. Um, and, it, you know, it was backed upon Western military and economic primacy, um, especially the period of unipolarity, um, US unipolarity at the end of the Cold War. But because, you know, this, this liberal international order locked in Western values and Western material dominance into the system, you know, for example, think of institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, it's only a matter of time until these dissatisfied powers, both great and small, would challenge this order. And that's what we've really seen over the last decade or so. So... You know, uh, as other um, other um, centers of power have, have risen, this order is no longer tenable. We just don't have the supremacy um, in the economic or the military dimension to uh, or even the appeal of our values now to to uphold this. So, um, you know, we've got these revisionist powers that are um, kind of. Uh, 
uh, teaming up with uh, discontents in the global south that are very resentful of the Western hubris um, that was espoused in the liberal international order and are keen for alternatives to being excluded or marginalised from Western-led government structures. Now, at the same time, um, China and, and other rising powers, they did benefit from the economic liberalism of the liberal international order, but they were never, they were never subscribers to the value side of it. And I think this is really where the sort of the sticking point comes. So, you know, the West deluded itself that, um, that um, the, you know, China would, would come around over time and democratize, but clearly the opposite has happened. And now Beijing basically spearheads a, co a coalition of authoritarian or other reformist regimes that directly uh, challenge the, the liberal aspects of the old order. So um, not only do you see us, of course, in the you know frequently mentioned uh, actions such as uh, thing uh, such as uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Beijing's refusal to recognise um, international law in the South China Sea, um, but that these countries are also kind of undermining the liberal order from within through you know non cooperation within the UN Security Council or the World Trade Organization. Um, you know that's clear, but. Then the other thing that, and you know, this is something that is sort of, you know, almost kind of, you know, happened while people have been asleep at the wheel, is that these revisionist powers are creating their own new institutions and um, and instruments of global governance or regional governance, when none of the liberal assumptions of the liberal international order, the values apply. Good example of this on the global scale is the BRICS. Um, with all of its, you know, attendant financial instruments seeking to, to compete with, you know, things like WTO and the, the World Bank. You've also got the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that people periodically rediscover, but has gone from strength to strength. Um, of course, China's got the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, these are all testament to the way that um, a parallel system of global and regional governance is growing up that reflects the values and the interests of um, the, uh, the the revisionist powers rather than the, the established liberal international order. So because of these, these you know, quite sort of earth-shaking developments that have occurred over a period of time, I'd say, you know, the, in, the, the liberal international order is not dead. It survives within the countries that subscribe to it within the West, and it governs interactions within, you know, between ourselves. But it's lost global traction as a global organizing pr principle. And so we've had to kind of step down or toggle back to something known as the rules-based order. I've noticed that people have been using the terms order, liberal order, rules-based order, but I think we've got to be clear about the distinctions between them, especially the value-laden aspect of the liberal international order. Now we've got the rules-based order where we seek to kind of de-emphasize some of these universal values and be more pragmatic about our, um, our interactions with, um, with, with third-party states. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, perhaps the best example of the, the rules based order is the free and open Indo Pacific that was mentioned earlier. You know, this is a really good example of a compromise. You know, we can, you know, we can still try and hold on to these, these, these liberal values, um, but we've got to be a bit more pr pragmatic where our interlocutors um, don't necessarily, you know, put these at front and center of their, their own national values. I mean, the good thing about the FOIP is it, you know, it covers free and open democratic principles. Um, it puts emphasis on economic prosperity, which is kind of a lowest common denominator, uh, and connectivity, economic connectivity, um, and a stable and peaceful security environment. But it's basically designed to be um, you know, uh, compatible with everybody sharing the same rules of the road based upon acceptable um, rules and norms, um, including, of course, the respect for international law, which is something that we're really trying to work in. So it's really a kind of liberal international order light. And in this sense, Sense, I think you know it has uh, greater potential for kind of spanning the bridge between you know the Western countries that are very much adhere to these these liberal international order principles, the democracy and so forth, and those that are sort of fit somewhere in between, such as you know various ASEAN countries and other developing countries who may nonetheless be um, keen to collaborate with the West. So anyway, there's obviously a lot more to be said, uh, including perhaps, uh, you know, giving some thoughts on the Australian perspective on all this. But I'll, I'll leave it here due to time constraints and, um, and, and be happy to resume discussion in the Q&A. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.
we have heard from four speakers, four uh, speakers uh, representing different disciplines and different uh, regions. And they all spoke on the same topic from different perspectives. I uh, would very much uh, encourage uh, audience to send uh, questions. In the meantime, I would like to pose a question to all of the speakers. My question to all the four speakers is as follows. The topic today is uh, liberal international order or rules-based uh, international order. Is it waning, declining? If it is declining, then within our own territory, for example, in case of Ukraine, in order to protect uh, territory, territorial integrity, integrity and sovereignty, do we need a greater military power? NATO decided to spend 2% of GDP on military uh, spending, defense spending. And it is said that Japan uh, may follow suit under Kishida administration in order to protect ourselves. Relying on international law may be difficult in the future. If so, do we have to resort to military strength or is it not the case? Liberal international order, is it not declining? What is declining is the international order created by the West uh, and Global South, uh, China, Russia, BRICS uh, are creating international order and rules and these international order and rules may have to be uh, followed by the West. Liberal international order, how should we understand the current status? And if it, if it is declining, do we have to uh, depend on a military power? Uh, if uh, we can have one word uh, from each speaker in the same order, starting from Professor Masuo, please. I think it's already deteriorating. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 this uh, role-based international order. Um, and um, uh, well, uh, well, I normally live in Japan and uh, uh, now uh, I'm visiting Australia for a short time. And when I talk with the uh, people in the Western countries, um, it's very different from uh, when I you know uh, uh, from the time when I interact with the people from developing countries. Um, atmosphere is very different. Um, uh, the people in the developing countries want to have more voices on the international system. Um, it doesn't mean that they know how to do it, but uh, in some way um, they are very happy to see uh, China. Russia and India uh, challenging the Western countries. So that's the entire atmosphere. Um, and um, and uh, China is somehow trying to uh, coordinate those countries. I'm not sure if it is going to be successful or not, but um, now uh, Xi Jinping has uh, proposed to create this uh, global partnership network. Um, well, uh, China has always opposed to have alliance alliance networks uh, or alliances, uh, and I have no idea how it is different from that, essentially. Uh, but uh, probably it's more like a political uh, coordination uh, planned for uh, developing countries. Uh, so, but in that, uh, I don't think um, uh, there will be anybody who is going to act as a uh, international police like uh, the United States used to do. So uh, the world will be, well, if their uh, voices get uh, heard, well, uh, uh, grow uh, uh, in future, uh, I suppose, I, um, I suppose, um, uh, the global society will be more self-reliant. Uh, people, uh, well, the countries would not help each other as uh, they did before. So that's my uh, expectation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Masuda. I think uh, Masuda Sensei, this is a question addressed to you. China and Russia, do they intend to make rules? And that would affect the vision of international order. If they engage in rulemaking, that means that the, they would also be bound by the rules they make. But in this case, I think uh, we can think about just China. Uh, do they want to make rules that would replace Western rules, rules made by the Western countries? Or uh, do they want to change status quo, not be bound by rules, but more freely and discretionally? 
I don't think uh, they have a clear vision on the uh, international on order uh, in future. Uh, but for the moment, um, there are more, um, how should I say, um, unsatisfied about the existing international order. So their goal is to break it down. And uh, on the surface, uh, they always uh, say that, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 non-interference in the international system is more important but you know that doesn't really solve uh, the existing international problems um but uh, since uh, their uh, uh dissatisfaction against the western uh, based uh, western centered international order is so strong uh, there are so many countries uh, who are supporting uh, the Chinese or Russian visions. Uh, that's why uh, the BRICS is expanding and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is expanding. Um, and I think uh, there will be the time uh, in the future that uh, those, countries will, uh, those countries will recognize that they still need to do something to uh, deal with the existing international order uh, in order to uh, 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 for the countries uh, uh, to uh, uh, for um, more countries to uh, uh, survive in this system, otherwise our uh, people will just uh, claim what they want, and and that doesn't you know uh, the uh, the countries will uh, hit on a deadlock, uh, but the that time hasn't come. Um, uh, to uh, that the time hasn't really come yet uh, and uh, I think uh, it'll take probably around 10 or uh, one or two decades uh, for uh, those countries to recognize that need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then uh, Dr. Louis Simon, could you address the same question? to protect the territorial integrity and sovereignty, do we have to resort more to defense powers? Uh, is a uh, rules-based international order waning? Yeah, no, th thanks, thanks. I think I, I would say, I, I would say yes. I mean, the short answer would be yes. I mean, but, but, but this is nothing new in the sense that I would say that the international order has always rested and continues to rest on power and ultimately on military power. And I would argue that what we call a liberal, rules-based, open international order uh, is first and foremost a U.S.-led order, which is by far the order's most important attribute. Uh, U.S.-led, I would say that makes for a more accurate description uh, than simply American, because the order is owned, but is uh, 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 sorry, is led, but is not owned by the United States, or at least not fully, in the sense that U.S. allies, particularly. Uh, in East Asia and Europe are co-tenants, if you will, and the order sustainability requires their their participation. So I would to go back to the military point. I would actually highlight that the uh, the, the what I call the hardware of the uh, of the of the order, and and the geostrategic trinity, if you will, on which the order rests, which is U.S. and allied command of the high seas and the other global commons, particularly airspace, outer space, and cyberspace, and that's ultimately military command. Uh, uh, which is something that China is partly trying to challenge and, and to a lesser extent Russia. And then the preservation of a favorable balance of power in East Asia and the preservation of a, a favorable balance of power in Europe. And these two regions are particularly important systemically um, because they, they harbor the demographic, industrial, technological and military potential uh, for any country that controls them to pose a systemic challenge to international order. So I think those are the three critical factors uh, uh, to uh, for the preservation of the international order, and they ultimately rests on rest on 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 on, on military power. Thank you. Same question I ask to Professor Ishi from international law perspective. Please go ahead. Thank you. First of all, rule based liberal international order is it receding? Yes. My answer is yes. At the current moment, with Russia's aggression of Ukraine and in Gaza Strip, even a humanitarian pause or ceasefire has not been worked out, even with much efforts. So it's difficult to deny that it's receding, but 
if it's a, what is it that is weakening? Can we call it uh, international order made by the West? I would like to leave a question mark. When one studies international law, of course, when rulemaking is done, there is a country that leads the effort, but then do all the countries follow that lead country? Each country has its own circumstances, and depending on the regional characteristics, the posture of each country would differ. So it would not necessarily the case that international rules-based order is receding because the West is becoming weaker. I, I don't think that was implied in the question, but there could be this way to divide West versus others, and whether it applies here, there's a question mark. And one suggested that BRICS would be doing the rule-making, but partialization of rules. Maybe we could say that that would uh, take ground. Rather than having a global common set of rules, each region or a certain group of like-minded nations will get together to come up with their own order. Then, if BRICS or the Global South will be the center of gravity, it's not going to be so simple to expect that that would happen. And there was a comment that China and Russia may make the rules. And regarding individual rules, there are independent uh, individual rules that one finds it hard to say that it's aligned with international role, law. But looking at the maritime aggression by China, partially what they are doing does comply with international law. For example, East, uh, East China Sea, continental shelf development, or in South China Sea, for control in South China Sea, there's they went too far in identifying the nine dash line, but there are some activities engaged by China that do comply with international law. And I would respond with uh, yes, the effective control over territory is the basis of order. So even if the order is based on rules, effective control is the major prerequisite. So the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Wilkins, uh, same question to you, please. Uh, thank you, Hosoi Sensei. Um, well, two responses to that big question. I think the first thing is that uh, you know the supporters of the uh, of the liberal international order or the Western powers in general. Um, they simply can't ignore um, the challenges that are posed to hollowing out that order or disrupting it by revisionist powers, nor um, on the other track, the kind of duplication or the supplementation of um, international and regional governance structures by their own brand of kind of generated structures like BRICS and BRI and so forth. So we've got to decide really whether or not we accept those, uh, whether we find some way to accommodate and uh, cooperate with those, or whether we um, oppose those parallel um, governance structures, be they international or regional. And I would agree with um, um, Masui Sensei um, that at this stage, those countries are quite content to sort of act in the shadow of the overarching order with these supplementary forms of um, of, um, of international governance. Um, they don't have the they really don't have the capacity to um, to displace. Um, the current international order, but uh, really, you know, that might change over time. Um, as was mentioned, you know, I don't think they really have a clear idea or a uniting kind of principle uh, behind which they can get back and displace the international order. So I think it's still got some, you know, uh, some life in it. 
The second thing we can do is get creative. Now, I already mentioned the free and open Indo-Pacific, and I think that's an excellent way of adapting the, um, the, the liberal international order that's very freighted with values and other kind of ideological bag baggage um, to the prevailing circumstances. So the, the FOIP is, is a good example of how we might adapt and we might sort of fill the space in between the uh, declining liberal international order and the as yet emerging alternative uh, revisionist order. Second thing we can do is really invest um, in minilateral forms of cooperation, which are again are a form of adaptation that we find, you know, these very large pan-regional um, security dialogue forums to be unwieldy, lacking in consensus and ineffective. So we get in smaller groups of like-minded kind of democratic or Western orientated countries to, um, you know, to enhance and strengthen um, the rules-based order. So the Quad, AUKUS, the Trilateral Strategic Dialogue between Australia and Japan are all good examples of that, and we see many, many more. So keep your eye on minilaterals in terms of being another response to this um, this challenge. And then, you know, last I would just echo um, what uh, Lewis said. Um, you know, I also, also mentioned that, um, you know, in order to project your values, to project your governance structures, it needs to be backed by material power. And so it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, what we should do in terms of how we, we you know, we approach the whole problem in international order and regional governance and, and so forth. Um, reminds me of uh, um, the former president, um, Theodore Roosevelt, when he talked about, uh, he said, uh, you know, um, he said, uh, talk softly, but carry a big stick. So I think we need to talk softly in terms of things like rules-based order and, and, and these kind of things. We have to be attractive. We have to be persuasive in winning over other countries. But then to deter um, uh, you know, challenges and uh, revisionist powers from, uh, from violating the principles of the order that we want to uh, project, then we need to be much better prepared in terms of kind of deterrence and responsive capabilities. Um, and then I'll just add one more point, actually, which actually just um, connects with one of the questions that have, has appeared. I think another challenge is not just the challenge from outside by revisionist countries, by, by external powers, but I think there's challenges to the liberal or rules-based international order that we still stick to from within our societies. I mean, if we look at the kind of internal disarray that we have, both at the political and societal levels at the West, this is... This is um, weakening our resolve to uphold the international order, and it's also creating tremendous opportunities for challenger states to spread misinformation, disinformation, and to, to and to fuel um, all of this um, dissension that we have within the West. So we also need to think about getting our own house in order before we can go out to the world and say, "Look, trust us. Uh, we've got the you know the right method, or the you know we've got an attractive model of." Uh, um, of international order for you and you know we want you to be part of it so that's something to think about as well thank you very much dr wilkins several questions have been submitted but uh, we have very little time left so there's an anonymous participant who has submitted a question and it's a question probably difficult for Japanese participants to answer. So I ask Dr. Louis Simon and Dr. Thomas Wilkins to respond. Right now, China in the Sengaku Islands are taking the salami slicing tactics, as mentioned by Professor Masuo. And step by step, although attention is not be being paid, Right now, they're trying to achieve a change of status quo. And to counterbalance that, what about permanent, permanent presence around the Senkaku Islands by Japan and US? So it could be the Japan Coast Guard or some kind of military presence. But in order to prevent China's attempt to change status quo, can't Japan and US intervene more actively? There is no permanent presence around the Senkaku Islands. What about US-Japan permanent presence? Will that lead to de-escalation or escalation? And can that deter attempt to change status quo? That would lead to strengthening of NATO for the defense against uh, Russia and in the Baltic states, NATO is becoming more aggressive in securing permanent presence. 
So what about something similar in the Senkaku Islands? It's just a short response by first uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Lee Simo. Thank, thank you for that. I'm, I'm not sure I, I got the, uh, the full story uh, because it, uh, I was a bit uh, confused. Uh, I, I think it's a question that uh, it's, it's, it's very nuanced, and, and I'm not sure I got the, the, the translation right. Um, it is the point because there was a point about uh, Japan and, and, and the U.S. being more forward leaning in the Senkaku Islands. Uh, 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 to see uh, if that deters China from expanding its presence there, uh, and there was a link to um to NATO being uh, uh overreaching uh, in, so the, in the in the link the to NATO is my own question, so it is not written in the question. I oh, okay. my I, my analogy to the question, uh, which can okay. be applied to European theater, but uh, maybe focusing on just. Uh, I like you to focus just on the question of the Senkaku Islands. How to on the Senkaku. It? So basically, the question is whether it makes sense for Japan and the U.S. Uh, to have a more forward defense uh, or forward deterrent strategy in the Senkaku Islands to uh, to deter China, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, if you that if you're looking for a short answer, I guess yeah. <laughs> okay, so I. <laughs> I, I switch to uh, Thomas. How would you think about this question? Difficult question. Oh, that is a tricky one. Um, essentially, I think what the uh, what the questioner is alluding to is uh, kind of creating a, a tripwire. You know that this is just a small thing, but then it, it trips. You know, a, a large response, and of course that raises some really, really uncomfortable questions about escalation so um you know it's almost in, in, impossible to answer i mean the other thing is i mean it's difficult to expect i mean when we talk about permanent presence does that mean permanent naval presence which you know naval presence is never exactly permanent or does that mean stationing um you know military assets on the senkaku islands themselves i mean that would that would change the nature of the question but what i would what i would say sort of in a more general con, con i mean that's very very kind of hypothetical and very very, very difficult to answer but what i would say more uh, in, in a more general sense is that one of the things and you know this has come out in all of the presentations one of the things that we find ourselves as kind of you know us allies slash western powers you know part you know part of this kind of side of the equation, um, you know, Australia too, is that we tend to be very reactive to China's, um, you know, hybrid tactics, salami slicing tactics, um, and all these kind of things, that we're always reacting. And that always puts us at a disadvantage being the, you know, the being the reactor. And, uh, you know, we might want to consider about being more proactive. So rather than sort of just, you know, exposing what China's done or something, you know, we might want to do, you know, take, you know, more kind of, like you know deniable but uh deniable but more proactive countermeasures well you know okay if you do a we're going to do b in response we're not just going to respond to a so you know it might be time to up our game a little bit and be you know forward leaning in the sense that we don't just you know sort of passively respond to these things and say oh they're bad and everything but it doesn't really deter but rather say you know well we're going to trade like for like so you do you know an action here and you'll see you know a counter reaction somewhere else perhaps um and that might be a little bit more of a, a forward leaning and perhaps a robust response than what we've been doing so far which is just simply responding to to everything china does which of course seeds the initiative to them thank you very much dr thomas wilkins we've run out of time and we've if we had had time, I would have wanted to ask the same question to Professor Masul and Professor Ishii, but two days ago we did an informal meeting and to Professor Ishii and to Professor Matsu, I asked you for your quite candid views, but this was the first session for Professor Louis Simon and uh, Dr. Thomas Wilkins because they didn't participate in the informal session. So I asked those additional questions. If you have final words, Professor Masul and Professor Ishii, you can have a say, but we've already gone over board the time and these were very nuanced, sensitive issue and using both Japanese and English languages, it was quite difficult to explain all the detailed nuances, but against these 
complicated issues. We are of the mission to be sensitive. Whenever policies are implemented, we shouldn't be just trying to find out a black and white answer. But what we must pursue is a nuanced, a balanced resolution. That's one learning that I have took out of the seminar. So I would like to finish here. And President Watanabe, please go ahead. Professor Hosoya and all of the speakers, uh, thank you very much for uh, your contribution over two days. And I would also like to th thank the audience for participation. Thank you very much. With that, we would like to conclude JFIR webinar. Thank you very much.